Everyone can see this okay? Now, as Ray and I talk through it, we're going to uh, just go through it and pause a little bit, and Ray's going to tell us a little bit about his setup and, and where we are. So without any further ado, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Ray, you want to tell us about your backyard here? Yeah, the, the first the first part of it is uh, where my Avery used to sit, and now now my wife's claimed that has her uh, her area. Um, I I moved it across uh, a bit about eighteen months ago. I moved it across to the other side of the yard, so that it faces directly east, so the morning sun shines straight into the uh, into the front of the Avery, and and it shines straight back into the breeding cages as well. Um, so the, but the only issue with it sitting there is the wind that comes around from behind it um, and swirls into the aviary. That's why I put the, the, uh, the perspex up the front to stop it from swirling in. Uh, and it gets quite cold with the wind because it gets very windy and warnable. And how, uh, how, how long during the year would the perspex be up there for, right? Uh, probably nine months of the year. Okay. Yeah, because and, and you often take it down, as you said, during the middle of the day, so that the birds in the breeding cages can get a bit of direct sunlight. Yeah, I slide them. I slide them open, so that the uh, the they can get a bit of sunshine direct through. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say it again? Sorry about that. <laughs> That's right, no problem. Siri wanted to talk to me. <laughs> um, it's um, yeah. So I, I built this one about eighteen months ago. Um, Purposely, um, uh, it took me a while to design it and and uh, come up with what I wanted. But it's got four flights that are about 2.4 meters long each, and they're about 1,100 wide, with a with a pop out of a of a half a meter of 500 mil out the front. Um, <clears throat> and underneath all of them, there's there's storage. I can store a, a full pallet of seed my show cages and anything else I want to uh, trolley, vacuum clean it, all that sort of stuff, get stored underneath. How many iterations of bird room would you have been through designing now, right? You obviously had birds over in FA, you had the birds on the other side of the the, uh, the yard there and then obviously back here, how many bird rooms have you had in your time in budgies? Um, about five. And each one's been an improvement on the next. Yes, yeah. I built, I built, I built this one. I'm getting a bit older. I built this one for when I'm, I'm an old bloke, and not chasing anything around the floor. <laughs> All right. Now uh, you mentioned when we saw um, recently, this was your Avery of birds going to the auctions. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've got in here in these seeds that we're looking at and the, the grit that's under the water there? In the in the ones that are closest to the to the bottom of the of the screen, um, there's white French canary and Jap millet. They're they're just plain seeds, um, and then there's a there's a combination of the three seeds in in the middle with some um, hemp oil and um, garlic oil in it, and there's some hold oats and. It's not in the picture, but a little bit to the right, there's a, a tonic mix. And then there's the, the two uh, narrower trays. They've got um, different seeds with some, some other oil and some molasses uh, and a few powders in it. Um, a few um, things like seaweed, hemp, that sort of stuff. And what are we looking at over here underneath the water? Uh, in in there, there's um, there's Vulcan and grit, um, and a combination of um, uh, charcoal, um, ephyte, um, yeah, what else is in it? Um, seaweed meal, yep. um, and some e powder. And what one. do we look? What do you have down on the floor over here? Is this sawdust? Yeah, yeah, it's wood shavings. Okay. Which and, under, the, under the perches. And this area that you've got over here where the branches are, the pop out, how do you go about cleaning that? Uh, it's got trays underneath it. Uh, there's a garden out the front of that. Um, and there's trays under there. And I just unscrew them from the, from, the, um, from the front, just drop them down and scrape them straight into the Fogo bin. Okay. 
And obviously, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the, the room's been built for storage. I can see down the bottom of the screen there the handles yep. underneath. What do you got hiding under this one? Uh, that's the first one. There's um, uh, white French under that one. No. It's uh, I've got I've got small uh, small garbage bins that that have uh, that are on wheels, um, and they hold two bags each, and they they just fit neatly underneath. Obviously designed to fit under there. Yes. Yep. Yep. Nice. Now we're going into Avery number two here. What are we looking at here? They're, they're my breeding hens, uh, are the ones I'm going to breed with. Um, there's from 2020 and, and older. Um, yeah, so that's that's just um, and I've got I've got the wood in the in the pop out there, the the um, the log, and the hens the hens love chewing on that, and that's that's when I I sort of see them chewing on it, and I know those hens are are getting ready to go down. So it's an indication of uh, when they're ready to breed. And typically, Ray, when when would you breed? When are you looking at putting these hens down? There's a couple of fit looking hens there right now. Um, I bred I bred through the winter last year, and and I lost a lot of chicks because it was so cold. Um, so then I bred in the summer and had a much better season. Um, and I've, I've just put a few pair down to get ready for the, a few for the, um, UBC shield in September. They have a few babies yeah. for that. Um, but I've also put feeders down to, to transfer the, the eggs into, into them and let them rear them. Okay. There's a few lace wings in there, there's a few black eyes, a few normals, some cinnamons, a couple of yellow faces. I used to have a lot of quite a few yellow faces, but I don't have so many now. So and obviously the same feeding regime between the Avery's, right? Yeah, all the all the Avery's are the same. Yep. Um, the the stuff in the longer trays at the back there takes took the adults a little bit to get onto that, but they um they really go for it now. The young ones the young ones clean it up within twenty four hours. Yep. Can't, I can't give too much to them because they just get too fat. You've got to be careful what uh, how much you give them. Same with the oats. They they would only get. Every Saturday, I I um I top them up, but the, the other seed gets topped up as they need it. We've moved into the third over year. I assume this must be the cockbirds. Yeah, it's the cockbirds. Um, I keep I, I keep more hens than cocks. Um, <clears throat> not not all visual. Um, because of the of the breeding of them, the background in them. Um, what would you yes, typically that, keep as a ratio, Ray? Like roughly how many hens and how many cocks at the beginning of the season? Uh, probably 60 hens, maybe a few more, and um, and about 40 cockbirds. About 100 budgies all up is what you're aiming for? Yep. And what do you generally try to produce in a, in a reasonable season? Um, I usually buy 250 rings. I get yeah. I get fairly close to it. Um, sometimes I'm a bit under. Sometimes I'm a bit over. So that's that's what I aim for. And then I, I start I start weeding out the lower end to the pet shop um, as I go. I think I think everybody breeds some pet shop stuff. Sam, again, all, all the flights have got the the um, the timber in it, the the uh, the logs in it. The cockbirds don't mind chewing on it as well. And you find that that natural chewing action is a really good indicator and sort of pushes the hens into condition. 
Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. You see them working the, the log pretty hard. You know, they're, they're ready to go down. Yep. And this is your fourth and final Avery. What are we looking at here? Babies, so I these, assume? These are all 2021 birds. Um, they're, um, they're in various stages of molt. Pretty much all of them in a, in a molt there now. Um, but yeah, they're... Um, I just leave them there. Uh, I, I don't do a lot with them. Just let them molt out, and and then uh, yeah, I, I start to pick out the ones that, that really aren't going to make it, and and they'll go to the pet shop. But um, yeah, I prefer to let them at least molt out before I start to uh, to really go hard at them. Yep. So they'll they'll be it'll be it'll be spring before I even look at them. There's a, there's a few in there that I like. There's a couple of grey greens, a couple of greys, and and there's a, a few um, lace wings in there I like as well. Nice. This is, All right. Tell us this, about this area. This is opposite the first flight as you come in the door. Um, obviously, sink and running water is, is um, I, I think, so, uh, very important these days. Um, I've got a small dishwasher in the right in the corner and a, and a fridge, um, hand soap, um, hand sanitizer, and a bit of storage. So that's where, that's where I prep everything to, uh, for the breeding cages. And these are obviously your cabinets here? Yep, 40, 44 cabinets. Um, they're not the most perfect things, I built them all myself. Um, but they um, they fit in there quite well, and down down the end is is um, some baby flights and, and a hospital cage and a and a brooder, um, just to keep the babies a bit warm when they come out. So I'm I'm putting I'm putting more heating in the other in two of the other small cages there. Yep. The, tim the timber's hanging on the on the the edge of the the flights. Um, there's there's one in, there's two in front of each flight, so I can fit four cages on each shelf, and so that gives me 24 show cages I can put along there to um, to sort my birds, give them a bit of show tra cage training, um, culling the birds, pairing up, all that sort of stuff. So they just they just fall down out of the way when I don't need them. You certainly designed it well, ergonomically. Yeah, it's about about uh, it's three meters wide altogether and nine point six meters long. Um, and there's about um, I think it's about one point three or one point four meters between the the um, breeding cages and the flights. That's just a few of the trophies I've won since, um, oh, they're all since 2016. Now there's a, a little rumor that the wife doesn't let you into this cabinet, is that right? Nah, she doesn't let me into it, keeps me locked out of it because I, I smashed my first national trophy uh, on the kitchen floor, so. <laughs> I hope that was by accident. It was, I, I got it replaced, um, but she won't let me anywhere near it now. So you think I'm too clumsy. Nice. All right, I think we're going to jump in now and have a look at a couple of the pairs you put together and uh, been fortunate enough to see some of the babies from them. So do you want to walk us through this pair here? This is, uh, he's a split lace wing. Um, he's a, a 17 bird, I think he is. Um, he's from my original lace wing line and a bit of Peter Thurn mixed into him. Um, and this hen here, she's um, she's by one of my original uh, line of cockbirds, um, and they they don't look visually they're not a they're not a, a real flash pair, but what they're producing is just beyond belief um, with the pairs. 
this is this is a 2021 um, young one. He's he's still in a heavy malt. Uh, he hasn't he has had much uh, much of a go in the in the show cage either. So he's a, he was a little bit flighty and and the other one in the cage is his older brother, um, who is um, who is quite a nice bird too. I think this will be a better bird when he finishes maturing. This is this is the other one. He's not showing real well there, but he's 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 he was a bit of a nut in the in the cage as well, but uh, in the show cage. But he's um he's quite a nice bird. This this bird here, he's a bit out of condition now, but he's he's won the the grey class at the Adult Shield the last two years. Um, produces some really good chicks. Uh, one of his young ones was the the um the best grey green at the Adult Shield this year. And what have you got him paired up to here? Pardon? What have you got him paired up to here? I've got him paired up to the same hen. Um, I paired them together in 2019. Uh, I didn't pair them together last year, but I've, I'm going to pair them together this year. This is one of my cinnamon hens. Um, there again, I, I've, I've had better cinnamon hens, but um, the pairing just um, just works. They've produced some really good chicks. They've got, I paired them together earlier this year as well. And um, I think one of the, the grey green sons will be one of the best birds I've bred. I think they're obviously one of those birds. Yeah, the bird on the left was the grey green winner at the Adult Shield this year. Uh, he's a 2019 bird. Um, <clears throat> he's got a, got a lovely cap on him, lovely directional feather. Uh, could do with a bit more spot, but um, yeah, just a, just a really nice bird when he's in condition. And this this is his younger brother. He's a 2021, he's still in his malt. Oh, I think he's gonna be a better bird again once he finishes malting. As a, more as an adult than a young bird, I think. They, they tend to mature very late. He's, a, he's bigger than his brother already. This is the, this is the same cockbird. Um, this is the hen that I'll be pairing, uh, pairing him to. Um, I had them paired together earlier this year and bred a really nice light green. Um, she's a big, strong hen. He needs a little bit more power to him. And um, she's a, a big, strong hen. So I'm trying. I'm trying to breed. I'm trying to to, to pair blue and and the, to get a rid, rid of the grey green a little bit. So to get a bit more, um, get away from the grey green and the grey green cinnamon a bit. This is this is the um, the son of theirs from earlier in the year. I think you'll grow out all right. And this this guy here was the United Diploma winner a couple of years ago. Um, I'm going to pair him to a grey normal hen. Um, she's a she's a big rough looking hen, but got a lot more size than him, a bit more bulk, and she's she's got some real directional feather. Um, he's he's a very soft feathered bird, very very loose soft feathered bird. So she's she's a bit rough, but um, he'll he'll uh, he'll tidy the, the wings up on her. Uh, this this bird this pair here I paired them up last year purely on on the breeding. Um, he's one of my cinnamons and and this hen is is related and they bred the the grey green that was second at the young bird shield and the sixth place bird at the young bird shield this year and and I, I paired them purely on breeding nothing else. This is this is their son. He's he was um, 
he was second in the grade green class at the Young Bird Shield this year. It was a, it was a very strong class. I, I, it was, uh, I think there was 40 odd birds and, the, and the, the first 20 were really good birds. Pretty banned here for a few of your birds, Ray. Yeah, this this is um, one of my cinnamons. He won he won the um, the first one won the the um, Ballarat diploma last year before COVID struck. Um, the second bird was the United diploma winner. Um, the third one is. Is uh, it was one of my lace wings that was in the in the video earlier, and then the the two black eyes were um, my two national winners. The first one was seventeen. The first one was sixteen. Yep. I've just ended that video quickly because there was another six people sitting in the waiting room, and I apologise to those people. <laughs> I can't uh, allow them to come in while I'm sharing the video. So um, I've had a question come through on a chat. It says. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the reason behind the charcoal and the Himalayan salt in the flights? Um, they'll they'll nibble away at the or lick the salt. Um, they need. They tell me they need salt. To, it stops a bit of the feather plucking. Um, but yeah, the 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 salt, the charcoal is is a is an antitoxin, so it, it helps to clean them out. Nice. And the, the brooder, is that something that you made yourself or is it a commercial item you brought in, the heater brooder? The one the one at the bottom, um, that I bought, brought both of them. Uh, the bottom one's a hospital cage. The top one is a brooder I brought from Sydney. Um, uh, Enfield Pets, Pet and Garden Supplies. Okay. Where I got that from. It's got, it's got a, a light and a, a ceramic heater in it. So you can regulate. It's got a. It's got a um, like a regulator on it. You can regulate the heat. Okay. Um, one of the other questions that's come through. Someone has asked: um, Do you have any sort of ventilation when the room is closed up like it is now? Do you have a fan or anything circulating air? No. Along the top, along the top is um, it's open. There's about four or five inches open right along the top. Uh, is is uh, allows enough ventilation. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, in terms of um, your feeding regimes, you, you showed us in the aviary, you've got a, more seeds than I've seen anybody have. Um, do you match that in the breeding cages or do you mix the seed in there? No, I mix, I mix the seed in there. But they, they, also get, um, they also get the one that's got the, the molasses and the oils and, the, and all the different seeds in it. They get, they get that in there as well. Um, and they and they get um, when they got young ones. I, I generally do some some uh, sprouted wheat, some um, hold oats, and and just a few other things mixed together. Okay. And when you when you do get the breeding season underway, how many hours of artificial lighting are you generally running in there? The lights the lights generally kick up around six o'clock in the morning. And they go off at around, start going off at around nine o'clock at night. So the, the the lights I have in there, there's two different sorts of lights. There's one one is the um, the fluoro lights or, or the um, the LED lights, and the other ones um, are on a a timer that starts at nothing and and ramps it up over half an hour to full light. So it's like a sunrise, and then in the in the at the end of the night, it starts to ramp down over 30 minutes, over half an hour, and down to nothing. And nothing is in you have no light, night lights at all? No. Never, I've never, never, ever run a night light. Okay. What about things like water supplements? What do you, what do you use? I use Rob Marshall's products. Um, things like Dufo and Iford. Um, I use his KD powder, um, those sorts of things. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people are on here tonight because they're very interested to hear about uh, how to breed a great black eye and, uh, and a, a great lacewing. You've obviously done very well at the Nationals with the, uh, 
with the black eyes. Um, what got you into the black eyes? Um, Wayne Cusack. And I never forgive him for it. <laughs> when, I, when I got back into birds when I was in South Australia, um, Wayne, I've known Wayne for many, many years and I went to his place just to get a few birds. Then he started chucking these black eyes at me and told me to take them home. Um, and I've just been fiddling around with them ever since. And how long ago was that? Uh, that was in 2007. Okay. Um, you obviously won the Nationals, I think, in 2016 and 2017. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Um, with, with Black Eyes. Can you tell us a little bit about those two birds? Probably the best Black Eye I reckon I bred was their, their grandfather. Um, who I never showed, he was a 2013 bird. Um, but it's, he, he had beautiful feather on him. Um, big square head, N not as big as the Hobart winner, but really nice bird. Um, and he, um, it, the feather seems to come out every second generation. It doesn't come out every generation. Uh, from what, I, what I've bred so far, every second generation, you get those ones that come out with, with the uh, the really long feather. So in twenty sixteen, the bird that won obviously was a twenty fifteen run bird. That was his grandfather. Um, what was he bred from? Was he bred from two black eyes from a two pair black of eyes. two black eyes? A black eye to black eye was a pairing you used. Yep. And what about the guy in seventeen? He, that's his full brother. A year later. Okay. Yep. They, they were full brothers. So visual black eye to visual black eye. Yes. Definitely does a trick for you. Yep. What was your breed, pairing I breed strategy? My, I breed my own splits. Yep. Um, I don't I don't buy splits in. I, I breed my own splits so that um, I can um, see what I'm breeding then. In terms of a pairing strategy for those birds, um, the 2016 bird, um, obviously there's a lovely black eye. Um, what did you pair him up to? I paired him to, uh, he, he bred with quite a few hens, a couple of black eyes and a couple of splits that I've paired him to. Yep. Um, and he bred some nice, nice splits. Um, the the um, uh, couple of his daughters were quite good, but his, his, his sons weren't, weren't as good. But then his, his grandsons were, um, were really excellent birds. Okay. And what about the 2017 bird? What'd you pair him up to? Never paired him up. What's that? <laughs> he was sold at the national auction that year. So he won and you gifted him off the next day? Yes. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't expect him to, to win. Uh, when I was invited to put the bird in a bird in the auction, I wanted to put a, a good bird in. And I thought he might run in the top five, but I didn't expect him to win. Um, he was in the auction, so uh, I had other brothers at home. So there's um, he away he went. Pretty tough to get a gig at the, the Ray Slate Farm. Obviously, <laughs> can't even win a national and get a gig. <laughs> um, I've just had a question come through on a chat. It says, uh, "What do you look for in in your hens, particularly for those those black eye cocks, the one that you did use, um, the 2016? What are you looking for in a bird to pair him to?" The best colour you can get, um, and yeah, they're all all my black eyes are related, so it's it's not about um, it's not about trying to pick a the right hen. It's um, well, you, you just got to get the best hen that suits the cockbird, um, a, a nice strong hen. Um, I like, I like a feminine type of hen. I don't like a hen with a hell of a lot of feather. I, I like a, a feminine type hen to breed with. Okay. And if you had, you know, in a perfect world, what would be the, the colour and variety of that hen? For an outcross, would be um, dark green or olive cinnamon um, or even a cobalt cinnamon. Okay. And, and what's a complete no? Um, anything other than anything other than cinnamon or normal. Um, oh, gray, I, I, a gray green. 
No, not a grey green. Definitely not a grey green. Um, mine have got grey green in them. Very difficult to get out um, and very hard to pick. Uh, a lot of judges have difficulty picking it. But um, the best way to get the feather is use a cinnamon opaline hen. But the opaline is a no-no, really, because you can't show them. Uh, they don't they don't compete because they've got to go in the opaline AOSV class. Um, sorry. Have you, ever, in the have you ever bred a decent opaline uh, black eye hen? Yes. Yes. It was fourth in the young bird shield and second in the adult shield no. uh, as a as an opaline AOSV. Um, but there's a lot of wastage. A lot of way. You've got to keep some really good records and a, and a lot of wastage going through that process so it's it's not a it's not a short term it's not a short term uh, project it's it's a three four year project but it's definitely one where you're pairing visual to visual at times you're pairing out to your, your obviously your cinnamon line um, we saw some great birds there that you won at united and bendigo with on the diploma um, but were gray greens and obviously you must be breeding some dark greens down through them to to bear into these, is that right? Trying to, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, the, the black eye is a recessive gene. Um, the, the lathling is a sexling gene. So I'd assume um, that they'd be a little bit easier to improve than the black eyes. Yeah, I I, um, I got third at the Nationals in, in Penrith and I set myself a goal of improving the lace wings and trying to win a national. Um, I got second in Brisbane and I think I had the bird that would have went close last year, but obviously the uh, COVID didn't allow it to go ahead. Um, so we'll see what happens in the future. I think I've got one there now that'll take a bit of beating. Nice. Um, you obviously have got some excellent colour in the lace wings. Where where did your lace wings start from? Where did you? How did you get into them? Oh, don't say Wayne Guzak again. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I've always had lace wings. I, I had lace wings when I was breeding as a as a novice breeder in New South Wales, um, and when I got back into them in South Australia, I was coming down through Albury, and a guy called I think his name was Les Warner was selling out and he sold, he put all these birds into a pet shop in Albury. And I just happened to call into that pet shop on the way through and brought a lacing cock there. And that's where they all started from. They all go back to that one bird. That's definitely fun when that happens. Yeah. How do you go about getting the, the, obviously when we saw the video there and the video probably doesn't do them justice, but they look like there's some very hot colored lutein, uh, Lace wings. How do you go about getting that colour in them? Are you using dark vector greens or are you using grey greens? Uh, I've mostly used grey greens and greys into them. Um, not a lot of dark factor birds, but mostly grey greens and, and grey cinnamons. Okay. What's been your biggest challenge with the lace wings? Um, getting the feather and the top end on them. What about the uh, the thumbprint that we often see on the, the wings of those things? How have you gone with that? Yeah, it's not too bad. I've had a, I've had a couple with it, but um, mine probably lack a little bit of depth of colour in the wing. They could they could be a bit darker in the wing, but they've got got the nice lace wing markings. What do you generally find affects that colouring in the wings? Uh, you need you need something with a fair bit of melanin in the in the, in the birds to get that dark, um, darker marking. It's interesting. I spoke to Martin Paoli a little while ago and he was showing me his grey wings and we're talking about strategies to improve the, the depth of the grey in the grey wing and it was the same thing, the melanin in the wing. So when you're looking at the bird, that, that real depth of the black in the wing markings tended to translate to something with these varieties where you have the stronger markings as well. And obviously you're seeing something similar with the lace wings. Yeah, I, th I, think, it's, I think it's very important. That you uh, that you use that. Okay. Um, in one of our interviews last year, Alan Rowe talked about a theory he had on the head feathering of the birds that it was in fact a mutation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
what we're seeing over in the UK and, Alan, and Alan's, probably, Alan's probably had the advantage of going over there and having a look and I haven't. Um, I, I think I think it probably is. When you when you saw the birds a few years ago, you know, I'm talking three or four years ago in, in coming out of, uh, of Europe and England, they had a hell of a lot of body feather as well. N now you're seeing them, the body feathers being pulled back, but the, the head quality is still there. The head length of head feather is still there. So it, it's quite possible that it is a, is a mutation. Okay. What are your thoughts? Obviously, uh, imports are reasonably topical at the moment. Um, the government's gone through their risk assessment. It is something that obviously uh, they're seriously considering for Australia. What's your thoughts on it? I don't think we need them. That's just my thoughts. Um, when you look at the quality of birds um, that are starting to be bred around Australia now, I, I think that we're just starting to take off with the, the feather. Um, there's, there's a lot more of the, the extreme feathered birds starting to come into Australia now that's um and if we keep breeding those birds together we'll um we'll end up with that sort of feather talking about breeding birds together and and, and how you get that mix um obviously we all have our nuances as breeders what would you suggest as yours what do you what can't you stand in your bird room what doesn't get a run um deportment's a, a big one i love a bird that's got style and and likes to stand and show um that's that's the main thing. I have I have a few there that 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 um, lack a little bit of deportment, but to the right birds, they've um, they'll Im they'll improve. Okay. But it definitely definitely never in a cockbird. The cockbird must always have have the style. Fair enough. Um, what are you setting out to improve in your stud this season? Length of bird. That's what I that's what I need to do now. But it's it's not it's not a one season job. Um, I always set a three year goal. Um, never never a one year goal. It's always a three year goal to um, to get where you want to go. And and in doing that, um, how closely are you inbreeding and mind breeding the birds? I breed cousin to cousin uh, to. Um, uh, to uh, to nephew, niece to uncle, um, I probably once or twice I've bred half brother and half sister, um, but never never closer. How do you tell if you've had a good, bad, or indifferent season? Like if you obviously pump two hundred and fifty chicks out and put some rings on, um, how do you actually look at that and go, you know, this is, you know, this was a great season? This was an average season or this was a horrible season. How are you making that determinant? Depth of quality. If you can, if the more quality you can get there, the, the better it is. Right. Yeah, if you breed, if you breed 250 birds and, and none of them have got quality, you know, is it a good season or is it no. a bad season? I, I, I would say it's a bad season. If you've bred a hundred birds, and 70 of them have got quality, I would say you've had a good season. Yep, no, I'd agree with that. Do you use fosters much at all with your birds? Um, usually, if I've got hens that have had infertile eggs, they'll get some to rear. Um, you, you, they never get a free ride in in my breeding room. Um, but this year, I've, I'll be specifically putting, I've put a few pair down now for the UBC Shield, and I've put um, six pair of feeders down as well. They are just um, little scrawny split black eyes. Fair enough. Now, Ray, um, tell me, do you remember what got you back into budgies or got you into budgies to begin with? I used to breed them years ago in New South Wales. Um, when I brought a, a, a one each for my kids and of course the novelty wore off after a couple of months and I got lumbered with them. Um, and, and then I got out of them for about 15 years. And when I was in South Australia, I said to Jane, my wife, um, I'm just going to get a few budgies to fiddle around with. And um, yeah, I told her I wasn't going to get serious or anything like that. So 
Yeah. And just to remind you about that daily? Does, quite often, quite often. I'm not a serious budgie breeder. What have, uh, what have been the most significant changes you've seen since coming back into the hobby? The, the money that's in here now. It's quite a lot of money. And, but the, obviously the birds have improved a lot too. I, I got out when, just when the imports were, I think the imports were here for a couple of years and when I got out, but the, the improvement in the birds when I came back into them and, and since then, the, I reckon the birds have improved a hell of a lot since then. Okay. Um, for, for somebody coming into the hobby now, for a newcomer joining, um, I know we've got a few beginners on here tonight and a few people who are interested to know, um, what would you recommend to them coming into the hobby now? If you had your time over, what would be the best advice you could give them? What I did was I didn't go to one specific breeder and, and buy birds. I bought birds from different breeders um, and just kept breeding them together. Um, bring a few in, breed them together, and eventually you, you end up with a with a, um, a line of birds, a lot, especially the hens. The hens can be carrying a lot of hidden secrets. I, I reckon they carry um, things hidden where the cockbirds must always be visual, but the hens carry the, the hidden parts. Um, don't spend a lot of money to start with till you learn, till you learn what you're doing. If you've not, not bred before, um, just just um, start out with some cheap birds and, and learn to look after them, learn to breed them and see what you see what you get when you do breed them together. Uh, my line of birds started from a $20 hen of, of um, Jeff Edwards and a $10 cock bird of John Mullies. And most of my birds I can trace back to that pair. Fair enough. Um, Ray, I've had a question come through in a chat that says, do you give your birds anything to set them up for the breeding season? And it says in brackets, medications or anything. So now as you're getting ready to put the birds down for the UBC shield, do you run them through a program of doxy or anything like Rob Marshall suggests? You yeah, earlier, EPI, earlier, earlier they had some, some doxy. Um, and then moxie T, um, some sulfur abs, and um, then then just um, into his water program. Okay. And you keep that water program going through the breeding season? Yes. So you'll give them KD while they're feeding chicks? No yep. issues at all? No. No? Okay. Um, one last one I've got down here. Um, so if anyone does have any questions they want to ping through on the chat, by all means... Send them in now, but um, one last one I have. Um, someone asked, "Would you would you use a bird that's missing a tail or any flights?" Yes. Yep. I was given as a novice breeder in uh, in South Australia. I was given a a cock bird uh, from a breeder that was getting out, and I had two birds to the nationals the next year from that from that bird. Um, never had it. Never had it tail issue with it. He had no tail and no wings. Um, <clears throat> the um, the bird that, that bred me two national winners, um, he dropped his flights at his second molt and never grew them back. Having any issues with them. Okay. I, I have had one more come through and it says, uh, do you crop feed your chicks and how long until you move a baby into the baby cage or your brooder? Um, I, I don't get a lot of time with work and stuff like that. So I only, I only crop feed them if they really need it. Um, and yeah, look, if they're, if they're out and, and feeding okay, um, I'll move them to the, to the, to the, to the, to the baby cage. Okay. Uh, I've got one here and it says, uh, Ray, you've mentioned that you've bred birds in New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. What's it going to take to get you to Queensland, not Neil Love? <laughs> uh, my son actually lives in Queensland. He lives at North Lakes in, in Brisbane. Um, but my wife doesn't like the humidity up there, so that'll be a no. Incidentally, it wasn't from Neil Love. It just says not Neil Love. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
right. Well, I think that's most of my questions wrapped up. Ray, did you have anything else you want to tell anyone? Or uh, yes, yeah, no. a shameless plug for the Riverina auction this weekend. Yeah, look, the, the Riverina auction is is not a it's not a a a, a well known auction, um, but it's it's growing in stature. There's there's um, a lot of us go out for dinner on the Saturday night. It's it's um, you know, I think there's about forty odd of us this year going out for dinner. So it's a it's a really great weekend. Um, yep. Malcolm and Rob Rand, Randall um, really put on a a good um, a good um, auction up there. The quality okay. of birds is getting better. Um, I brought a, a ninety dollar hen of Barry Wise's up there a couple of years ago and bred a diploma winner from it. And and that that hen was um, fourth in the Young Bird Shield in the double factor class. Her sister was fourth in the Spangle AOSV class um, from a ninety dollar hen that that came from that auction. Nice. All right, well, thank you uh, very much for your time tonight. I think it's time to hand back over to Chris if we're all done and dusted. There's no more questions coming through on a chat. I think on behalf of everyone, I'd like to say thank you. I'm sure everyone's found it as enjoyable as I have and hopefully got a little bit out of it tonight, um, particularly with reference to the black eyes and, and the lacing. So thank you very much for your time. No worries.